Welcome back. It's week 35 on Out on That Line podcast. It is good to be alive. My name is Jeff with my co-host Alex. Alex, how we doing this week? Oh yeah. I want something to take my sky high. I'm feeling good, Jeff. <laughs> feeling crazy. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. We've got uh that's good. We're going to bring some energy to this episode. We've got a couple things to talk about. Um we've got some listener submissions. That is plural submissions with an s at the end so that's always very exciting so thank you to orion is that how you, that's how you say yeah. it just like the orion. constellation okay and brandon friend of the pod brandon um so first we're going to talk about a single called plow the shit by a man named ben kaplan and then later in the episode we're going to be getting into the album calico jim by pony bradshaw submitted to us by brandon the single plow the shit submitted to us by orion on our instagram and you can also dm us with album submissions right there on our instagram or our twitter or the facebook or send us an email you'll find that email out on that line at gmail.com let us know what you want to hear about um, because they're starting to roll in i think this is what our second week in a row with with listener submissions it's getting hard to keep track of them now too um, i used to have a running playlist and i abandoned that and now i don't know i don't know what to believe well, I mean, I, I guess that's just a sign of success, you know, to the moon, baby. Apparently. Yeah. Can just we like, start big dogging our listeners and just like not taking any more submissions? <laughs> or or they have to be above a certain threshold. Yeah. Yeah. And we decide that's totally arbitrary every time. Explain to us why we should take the time to listen to your pick. Yes. And don't be wrong. Should we come up with like a, a form to fill out? Just like a, a Google Doc that we share. Like a college essay type thing? Yeah. I'd be down for that. Yeah, just like a little prompt. Be like, tell us tell us why you think we should listen to your album. That'd be good. We get one Webster's Dictionary defines. Which, no, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> Disqualified. I, I will tell you, if somebody does take the time to write a properly formatted essay... Minimum three paragraphs because, you know, you need the beginning, middle and end. Mm -hmm. You need your you need your introduction. You need your conclusion. Um, But the longer it gets, the more likely we are to give you more time on the episode. But if you submit a fully formatted essay, I guarantee you we will talk about it on the episode. Yeah, that'd be like my favorite thing ever. And that's uh, pursuant to that. When people send us stuff, tell us why you like it. Mm-hmm. Ser- that's now a serious suggestion is yeah. tell us why you like it and why you're recommending it. And if you write something cool, we'll we'll say it on the air. We'll be like, Jessica picked this one because it reminded her of that summer in Cancun with the ladies. So, like, <laughs> whatever the reason is, I'm f- knocking stuff over on my desk. You just let us know. Yeah. I mean, we talk about all the time. I mean, when we when we review albums, we always talk about how we interpret it. You know, yeah. and so if there's a way that you, you know, a lens, a specific lens that you're looking at that particular song or album through, we want to know what that is so that we can try to kind of see it from your point of view, because it may be the difference between us understanding something and us not understanding it. Um, so just let us know, because I think that just adds more layers to it. And that's the point of why we're doing the podcast is just to take a deeper dive into music in general to understand it better ourselves, but also see if we can get other people interested in why we're interested about certain things, you know, and, and I think that's something that, you know, we strive to do and we're thankful for all those listener submissions that we've gotten so far. And, but we think we, we think you can do better folks. Yeah. We, we can, do better. can do better. Yeah. Yeah. I would I, say, yes. I would agree with that. Some of you guys need to work on your elevator pitch. Okay. Yeah, just, I mean, quick few sentences at minimum, you know, like I said, write a whole essay if you'd like. We'll read it, maybe, Um, but if you write the essay, I guarantee you we'll talk about it on the podcast. Absolutely. We'll at least mention that you wrote it if we don't actually read that, all your hard work. So you're guaranteed exposure, and you can't buy that. You can't, but you can if you want. If you want to pay us, we will accept gladly. Yeah, Venmos are open. Yes, always, always open. So, why don't we start out with the single Plow the Ship by Ben Kaplan, submitted by Friend of the Pod, Orion. And I think you know more about this one than I do, so I'll let you start on this one. Well, 
in terms of like knowing anything about it, I've just listened to it a million times. It was the soundtrack to getting off the train at the end of a long day of working for Hulu and just like walking through all the other miserable ham and eggers going home. And it's like the perfect, the absolute perfect theme song to where I lived and how I felt at the end of the day. Um, and I think it was actually funny enough, Brandon, who other friend of the pod, Brandon, who sent me that song a long time ago. Hmm. So when Orion sent it in, I was like, oh, buddy, do I know this song? But I didn't realize Orion, before he went to college with me, we went to theater mm -hmm. school together. Before we were both at UVM, he went to college with this Ben Kaplan guy. That's funny. So did he like, did he know him? personally or just somebody that he knew as like an acquaintance I, you know i think he if i'm remembering correctly i guess i could look at instagram but if i'm remembering correctly he intimated he knew the guy that's fine and if, it, if i don't know if that's true we should definitely like get orion like a blurb from him to tell us about it yeah and it, you know funny enough speaking of weird connections and i'm not going to give out orion's government name here on the podcast but his last name struck a chord with me because I'm pretty sure, I don't know if it was his mom, probably his mom if it's, yeah. Uh, when I used to work at the Golden Eagle Resort in Stowe when I was in college, there was a conference and I believe his mom was the contact for that conference because the last name is is fairly unique. Oh, if yes. I'm, yeah, so it's, I'm pretty sure, I I don't know if I've ever met Orion, but I'm pretty sure I've met his mom. How interesting. What a small world this, our, our little blessed state is. Yeah. And Orion, you can let us know if her name is Teresa, I think is what it was. If if I'm correct, it is a very small world indeed. See, I should know. Um, that makes me a bad friend. I did a play with his dad <laughs> once. I met his brother <laughs> once down at Emerson. Like, I pretty much like can say I, within a statistical certainty I know the family, but I don't know your mom's name. Sorry. <laughs> well i mean i guess i guess we'll find out i guess we'll find out it would be a strange coincidence if that last name existed completely separate you know these two people completely separate have the same last name yeah yeah that would be that would throw yeah me. um but i really i enjoyed this song i'd never listened to it before i'd never heard of this guy ben kaplan um you know it's definitely i think it's part of a musical that he wrote is that correct I mean, that I don't know. I literally, like, I probably should have looked more into it, but I've yeah. just listened to the song so many times. I was like, we're just going to talk about the song. I don't need to do anything. Yeah, well, so, it's, it's I don't know. very much gives me that, like, musical type of vibe, just with how dense the lyrics are. It's very much like a, um, it struck me as more of a speech than a song. But mm -hmm. in, you know, singing, he just got, like, such a big, powerful voice, too, that it was really, it, it'd be impossible not to pay attention to if this song was just playing in the background, but listening to it, you know, on my headphones and like really trying to digest what he's saying, there's a lot going on. And I know this is a, an out on that line trope, you know, about Dylan's masters of war. This could very well be the closest thing we've gotten to that. Um, as far as lyrics go, because there's just, there's a lot going on and I like how it ends with, him saying in the world belongs to those who plow the shit you know it's mm -hmm. just like no matter what happens no matter what happens in the world everybody dies and the people that are in control of that area are really the ones that are in control of everything because at the end they're the ones that are still kicking well and i'm reminded of the george carlin quote it's a big club and you ain't in it in reference to politics and mm -hmm. that's kind of like spiritually what's going on in this song is ben kemplin talking about you know Heaven is reserved for the righteous and hell is for the really bad people. But what about everybody else? The proletariat, mm -hmm. the 99%. What about them? They plow the shit. So you you technically, like, if we all rise up, we're a greater force than anybody else. But that's not possible. So here we all are plowing the shit. Yep. Yeah. It's a really, a really interesting song. I really, I like this one quite a bit. It's probably going to be one that I listen to consistently from here on um because it's just like one the guy's voice is yeah you know just it's it's hard to describe it's like very meatloaf-esque but with a lot more gravel in it you know it's got that same kind of power at least so that's it kind of struck me as that and i think because you know the lyrics are very dense and it's this very kind of oddball 
kind of approach to writing a song that it kind of gave me those like Jim Steinman kind of vibes as well you know Mm -hmm. and it's just you know it was it was a lot to take in but you know when you really try to focus on what it is it's not as if he's being very deceptive about the themes he's going for or anything like that there's just a lot of information that's getting passed on to you through this song and i think it's kind of a feat of songwriting that he was able to accomplish this with as much as he put in there and still have it be an enjoyable listen without feeling like you're working too hard to kind of understand what's going on dude he's so fucking lucky too because he he must have lungs the size of wings inside of his body Mm -hmm. he just you're right when he he has meatloaf volume he can produce so much sound but i would say the sound is more of a tom waits and the whole song is honestly like kind of a tom waits Mm -hmm. tin pan alley like the production the like squealing brass instruments it's very chaotic it's very dark it literally i literally just see this giant bearded ben kaplan guy dragging a cart down a mud street kind of like a bring out your dead type thing yeah um but the sound his voice is like it's like tom waits that growling like all the tom waits stuff is very subdued and like mm-hmm. eh, i knew a one-legged whore and like <laughs> It's a very specific thing, and Ben Kaplan found a way to like put a meatloaf engine into a Tom Waits voice, and it's yeah. so fucking. I'm so fucking jealous, dude. Yeah, and I mean, some of the lyrics are just really, really good as well. I mean, there's a special place in hell for fancy talkers. There's a special place in heaven for the horse. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just like it's it's that kind of viewpoint where it's like, yes, we are the common people. You know, we 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 get told all this stuff in mainstream media and by politicians that, you know, they're the ones that know what is good and right, and they're the ones that know who belongs where and and all this kind of stuff. And you know, uber religious people, and it doesn't really matter what religion it is. You know, it's just there's all these people that have very lofty idea of themselves and don't if they really subscribe to the tenets of the things that they're trying to teach or trying to tell us about you know they would know that they're the ones that are more likely to end up in hell than the ones they are saying that actually that they think belong there you know and i think Mm -hmm. it's just you know it's changing that viewpoint there's tons of songs that do that kind of thing as well you know there's there's plenty of folks that have that have done these same themes but not everybody's got a voice like that not everybody's got you know, the ability to write a song like a musical, but still make it sound like your know, regular song. You know, it's a pretty, pretty interesting song. Certainly recommend that people check this one out. Definitely. And, you know, it's not like a Dua Lipa style club banger, although I would love to see hipsters in Williamsburg dancing in a club to this song. It would be the greatest. Um, But yeah, it's just cool. It's over the top. It's theatrical. It's loud. Mm. It's chaotic. It's just a fucking great song. So thank yeah. you to Brandon for originally suggesting it to me and for Orion for bringing it up again. And I would be remiss if I, on the off chance he listens to this, I could do an inside joke or an inside reference. Okay. Doppley. He'll know what it means. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Thank you, Orion. Um, we'll always, always be happy. You've, you've shown out in a big way with your first submission here for the, for the pod. So feel free to submit again. Um, we'd love to take a look at whatever you got for us. Yeah. Um, thanks buddy. You can stop listening to the episode now if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to get into Brandon's submission. So he had a quasi submission in the first segment here. This set, this episode's all Brandon, all Brandon all the time. Congratulations, mm-hmm. buddy. This episode is for you. <laughs> this one is going to be Calico Jim by Pony Bradshaw. Um, So we tried out last week that we were going to just strictly stick to, you know, a handful or six songs that we really wanted to talk about. And we're going to do that again this week because we think it made for a kind of leaner episode, helped us out because it keeps us on track, you know. So if this is something that y'all are really hate to hear, just let us know. We're probably still going to do it, but we're always willing to listen to the feedback at least. Mm hmm. Yeah, I the only downside I see to it, and I'm not saying we change anything, but like if someone's listening, they're like, oh, man, I can't wait for them to talk about uh, Rumbly Bones or whatever the song is like. Yeah. And then we just go, we didn't pick that one. How crushed some of these people would be. But once again, great reason to write in and cuss us out. And the next episode, we can always give you a little break you off a little treat. 
yeah, we do love mea culpas on Out on That Line. That's kind um, of our speciality. Yeah, and I, I would also bring up, though, you know, because of the other way that we would do it is we'd have the six songs that we would really dig into, but then we'd just kind of, like, mention the other ones and just skip right through them. Yeah. Like, which would you like, which would you rather have happen? You know, if you're real excited about one, we're just like, oh, yeah, that's uh, Rumbly Bones is the fourth song on the album. We're going to go, we're going to move on to the next one, you know, yeah. versus not hearing it at all. I don't know. Yeah, that song fucking sucked. Yeah, no one wants to hear that. <laughs> Should we just start saying the other songs suck, whatever, even if they're good? Axiomatically, yeah. Yeah. That song fucking sucked. Yeah, these other songs blue ass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you had chosen the leadoff song on this album, Calico Jim. Um, now, I will give listeners the caveat here that normally we're able to pull up lyrics we're able to pull up interviews and things like that to kind of give some more context to the album uh very difficult to find information on not only pony bradshaw but especially this album there's only two songs that we're able to find the lyrics for and we're experts at finding lyrics folks back before out on that line existed we both were big into the game of figuring out the lyrics to songs so if we can't find them they don't exist. So mm -hmm. we're going to do our best here. But really, a lot of these songs, it's going to be mostly like a, a little vibe check on them. You know, we're going to give our thoughts on them, but that's without the ability to really dig in and, and read all the lyrics. You know, listen to it as best we can. And, you know, I listened to it a few times just because I knew I didn't have the lyrics to rely on. So I was like, I want to get as much out of it as I can. Um, but yeah, just to let folks know um, that this one's going to be a real, real vibe check type of episode. Yeah, we're we're going with the essence of the of the album here, really, yeah. more than anything. I would like to say two things that I hope don't color the listening experience from the top, but I did manage to find a couple interviews with Pony Bradshaw. Okay. Um, I got some basic biographical details. Military brat, tried to join the Air Force, got kicked out, got into songwriting late in life, like 38 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and this album, he's self-releasing because he says, you couldn't release an album like this on a label. And I'm like, I, I don't understand why you think that, but whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> in a lot of his interviews, if you go looking, he says a lot without saying anything at all. Mm -hmm. And then the very, very sus thing that he says, which blows my fucking mind, they ask him what he's into musically, and he goes, I don't really listen to music that much anymore. <laughs> That's very strange. If you listen to the songs on this album, they're all really well constructed, and I can tie them into other things that apparently didn't influence it because yeah. he doesn't he's a musician who doesn't listen to music that is the wackest shit i have ever heard so again i'm not trying to color the episode because mm -hmm. to skip to the end i really like this album a lot i i'm just like he's gotta be fucking pulling my leg this is this can't be real you, you're a musician yeah. who doesn't listen to music what the fuck yeah, I mean, and I can understand at a certain point when you're like making the album, a lot of artists will do that where they'll just specifically not listen to other music because they don't want to have that kind of subconscious influence on their own songs, you know, so they'll avoid listening to anybody else's kind of music, at least in their like genre, you know, so that they don't have those influences show through and they don't accidentally like use a chord structure that somebody else already did so that, you know, there's a very specific reason and very legitimate reason why when you're crafting an album and when you're trying to write music that you don't listen to other stuff, but just to say you don't really listen to any music at all. That's a very strange thing as a musician to say. Yeah. I, I I did not know what to believe, Jeff. I'm I, is he an Andy Kaufman level genius, just pranking people for extra fun, or 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 what's going on here? I don't I don't I don't threw me for a loop. Yeah, that's that's very strange. I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that a little more. Um, but it, it, yeah, that's a very, I guess very interesting. But it's also like I didn't hear a lot of new ideas musically. Mm -hmm. On this album, you know, I've heard a lot of these things before, and I'll talk more about that when we kind of get further into it. Um, so it's strange that he doesn't listen to music now, like, or at least he says he doesn't, because it's like, this is very much an in vogue type of country music right now, is, is his style of country music. There's a lot of other folks doing the same type of things now, not saying that he's unoriginal or anything like that, mm -hmm. but it's not as if he's come up with some groundbreaking new style of music or anything like that. So it's just very strange for him to say that. 
Can you imagine if he thinks he does? That would be hilarious. <laughs> if he just I'm doesn't pretty realize. sure nobody ever played no damn fiddle before. <laughs> uh this this guitar has six strings on it, so I'm pretty sure no one else is doing this right now. Since sliced bread, motherfucker, get ready. <laughs> Uh, so he starts out the album with Calico Jim, which is the title track. Um, and this was one of your picks and one of the few that have the lyrics available. So why don't you let me know your thoughts? I liked it because, again, it's a great introduction to the album and it gives you a great sense of what it is we're going to be talking about. And it set up a really interesting kind of question that I carry through the album with me. Because Pony Bradshaw, Southern guy, um, I think Mississippi and Georgia are the two places he spent the most time. Mm -hmm. um, and as an army brat, he's kind of on this perpetual quest for community and, and integrating himself into his surroundings. And he's deeply in love with the South. And I'd like to preface this with, that's a fine thing and I have nothing against the South. Mm -hmm. um, but it he kind of paints a complicated picture because I think to some people Southerners are cretins and oh, I'm down by the holler and they're they're stupid and and they're all Trumpers and that kind of thing and in Calico Jim the song and the album but the song mm -hmm. he's really kind of trying to make these characters more complicated and show that like nothing is axiomatic your stereotypes of a hillbilly are going to pop up on this album, mm -hmm. but we're also going to dispel them. So, for instance, uh, he talks about how Calico Jim is a guy that doesn't take sides, lives in a red <sighs> state, but doesn't take sides. Mm -hmm. And fence sitting is toxic to some people, but I prefer to look at it as like it, it just makes him a more complicated guy because he doesn't have any political allegiances just like he doesn't really have a home he's mm -hmm. searching for that too he's kind of trying to put together who he is and what his identity is and i i think that comes from being a 38 year old singer songwriter who got to live life before he got into yeah. the music industry yeah you know what kind of struck me about this one is if folks have you seen the movie 12 years a slave mm -hmm. so brad pitt's character in that movie you know, when, when he get, gets given the letter and he's torn whether to send it or not. He's like, do I really want to take a side here? You know, I'm making myself a pretty good life. Do I really want to take a side here? Mm -hmm. And he ends up sending the letter, which allows, you know, the main character to gain his freedom. Or regain his freedom, I suppose. And it's that Calico Jim kind of reminded me of that character. Where there's all these traditions, you know, there's all these things that don't really necessarily affect him at least the negative sides of it and it's the idea that you know why get involved in something that isn't your fight you know and it's it's you know i think calico jim the character ends up not getting involved in the fight at least not in this song and it's that choice you know of like well if it doesn't affect me how involved should i get myself into it you know and you see a character like brad pitt's in 12 years a slave gets himself involved at the risk of his own health and his own freedom, you know, but sees an opportunity to help somebody out that he can tell really needs it. You know, he has an opportunity to do the right thing and he doesn't have it in him not to do that. And I'd like mm -hmm. to think that given the same kind of opportunity that Calico Jim would do the same thing, you know, and maybe not, it's maybe not presented in this song, but I think he builds that character so well that you get an idea about who this man is, who this man is supposed to be. And while he's saying, I don't want to get involved, I don't want to get involved, the more somebody pushes him and he says, I live in a red state, but I don't pick sides. The more somebody pushes him, the more likely he is to be like, well, wait a minute. If you're really trying to push these ideas, I don't think I agree with them. And I wasn't going to say anything before, but now I'm going to. And that's kind of the sense that I get from this character that he's that he's building here. Well, I think it all also comes back to, once again, this idea of community, because if you're new in a new town, what stake do you have in it? What stake did you have in Texas when you first got there? What stake did I have in New York when I first got there? You know what I mean? Yeah. You're a stranger in a strange land. You don't know anybody. You don't owe anybody. Mm -hmm. But the more you get to learn the community around you and your neighbors and you 
integrate into this time and place, you do have a stake in it. You've got skin in the game, and that's when you have to make decisions. Mm -hmm. Are you a red state or are you a blue state or what do you believe and what are you going to fight for? And that's like a huge bite to take on the first song of the album. Yeah. But it poses that great philosophical question and a really great theme that carries us all the way through to the end. Mm -hmm. It sure does. Um, and you also selected the next song on the album, Dope Mountain. Yeah, this I think add some texture for me to this idea that this is a community that's very rough around the edges, um, sort of forgotten, full of somewhat jaded, perhaps somewhat, I don't want to say barbaric or backwards, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I, what would you say? What would you call someone who's not necessarily like I, barbaric to me is like they're killing each other in the streets, but if they're just yeah. kind of like, stuck in a different time and place and frame of thinking i can't think of an economical word to say but you get what i'm saying yeah i think though i think you're just what you're saying is the world has kind of moved past them yeah you know, they, they've of. they've isolated themselves in such a way that the rest of the world has moved on and they haven't moved along with it yeah exactly yeah. and weirdly enough not necessarily relative to the song it's a great song mm -hmm. um I really like the lyrics. I really like the the sound of it. He has a great gift for something that I love, which is the ability to transport you geographically through the way that he makes the song sound. Like, I've never been deep in Appalachia or, or mm -hmm. the Ozarks or anything like that, but I definitely can see it very clearly based on memories I've put together from movies and books and shit like that. Mm -hmm. He just effortlessly and instantly transports me to that like the best songs do and he does that really well with this song yeah and he straddles the line and the way i kind of what i was able to pull out of a lot of this is the musical qualities of it you know well you can pay attention to the lyrics as, as much as you can without having them in front of you it's tough to you know he does he is very dense lyrically at some points as well so it's it's not as if it's a pop song where they say the chorus 18 times and it gets mm -hmm. drilled into your head. You know, there's nothing catchy really about any of the songs that he has on here. He's telling stories. You know, that's not the point of why he's writing these songs. But he does straddle the line between that Appalachia type of music and outlaw country the same way that like Tyler Childers does, the same way that Sturgill Simpson does, where it's like you get the best of both worlds. And when he does, you know, he has that steel guitar, you know, that kind of very whiny, classic country guitar mixed with a palm muted acoustic guitar kind of playing out the rhythm parts of it. And the way he balances those things adds, like you said, not only adds a kind of, you know, you get the sense of with that type of music where it comes from. So you start picturing, picturing those things in your head. But then also musically, it sets the mood. You know, so he's able to match the music with the mood so that even if you can't catch every little thing about the lyrics, you know what he's trying to convey to you. You might not know the exact story, or the exact names or anything like that, because you may not be able to pick them up the way he sings. It's because sometimes he mumbles a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's it's very much easy to understand where he's coming from. And when you kind of get an idea that this album is, you know, I, I don't it's not all about Calico Jim, but that's who we're, that's our start off point, right? That's our, mm -hmm. our, our kickoff point to finding out more about this particular world that they're in. And I think we're kind of looking at it through the eyes of this Calico Jim character, but we're getting all these stories about all of these other things that he's interacting with. And it's a very interesting way that he put this album together to do that. You know, and I think it, it adds to listening to the entire thing sequentially, you know, and it, we talk a lot about the sequencing of an album. And I think what he does here is perfect for this album because you get little bits of this story. You don't get a one linear story all the way through. You get these little snapshots of all these lives in this, in this part of the world. And with it at the end, you, you get to kind of put them all together and he leaves enough out that you make those connections yourself and you can be as creative and as, as imaginative as you want with putting those connections together. But it, it's, I think it takes a really great talent. I don't know if it's something he actively tries to do or if it just happens to be that that's the way he writes songs, mm -hmm. but the way he puts the things together and the way he puts the music with the story, with the lyrics is a really interesting thing and, and definitely keeps it interesting throughout the entire album. 
Yeah, and Dope Mountain is one of those songs that really texturizes the character. It's like, you know, interesting characters and stuff like that populating this world. Again, transporting you geographically because vision is such a huge being able to visualize it is such a huge part of developing our empathy Mm -hmm. and again these are people that are more complex than just like your standard redneck and calico jim is kind of like you say an every man or an every hillbilly yeah and and that's kind of the lens we're seeing this through and this song also reminds me it's a little bit of a detour but it reminded me of trailer park boys okay and a very frustrating argument about the show that i had with rory where he basically said he doesn't like Trailer Park Boys because it's a show that's predicated on making fun of poor people. Mm -hmm. And I told him that is a fundamental misunderstanding of the show. It is a show about community. These people know they're fucking poor. But that's it's not, ha-ha, look at how fucking poor they are. It's look at the shenanigans they get up to to protect the park, which is theirs, to protect their family, to protect the people that are important to them. Mm -hmm. It has always, always, always been a show about community. And it's a fucking show with a very sweet heart. And I get vibes similar to that from this song. Like, these people might... You, if you're Rory, might dismiss these people as scumbags or poor or whatever. (laughs) But, because that's his other complaint. Everyone on the show is fucking scumbag. Well, he's, um, not, he's not totally wrong about that. He's not wrong, but you like Kenny Pow- <laughs> you like Kenny Powers, but you don't like the big bad Julianne. Like, <laughs> at any rate, um, I just I I appreciate that he's taking the time to make these people a little harder to pe- to peg than maybe someone else would. Yeah, that and that's I think that's fair because I think it's you know you never know. You know, there's that saying, you never know a person until you walk a mile in their shoes, right? And and you can think all you want about because they're from a certain part of the world, they've, they're have they totally different than me. They're going to have these specific views because everybody from that part of the world has those same views. And it's, it's just, it's not as simple as that, you know? And I think that's an album like this is trying to convey that message, you know? And I think by using characters instead of his own, you know, first person perspective, having it be kind of third person through a different character allows you to kind of put yourself in that position, you know, better than if he were just writing it, you know, from his own first person perspective about all these things, you know, where he experienced these things in real life. Cause it's, I feel like that almost adds a barrier doing it the way he did removes the barriers. It allows you to kind of immerse yourself in this world right alongside him as, Mm -hmm. as these characters are experiencing everything. And I think it adds to the empathy that you're able to feel for these characters. I think it adds to the understanding that you're able to feel for the things that they go through and why they live the way they do. You know, and I think that's a big question. That's a big question that rarely gets answered when we talk about folks from this part of the world. You know, we just get a very specific snapshot of who they are and, you know, the, the wild and wonderful whites of West Virginia. I don't know if you ever mm-hmm. saw that. And, oh, yeah. you know, whenever you see that, you're like, wow, these people live like that. And, you know, I feel like parts of that documentary are OK, but very much it, it kind of lends itself to those stereotypes about people from Appalachia. And I think he does a great job here of making sure that we understand that these are human beings that just happen to be born in a different place, have different circumstances, but they're trying to live the best they can with what they're given. And I think that's a really important thing to realize when you listen to this album is if you allow yourself to be open to those ideas, this album is really, really going to do great things for you. And it's very rewarding. Again, like you said, if you can keep the open mind and I, that for me dovetails into a song you picked, let us breathe, which I think kind of continues with these types of people. You, you, when you invoke the wild and wonderful whites of West Virginia, West Virginia is kind of where I put this in my mind. Although Mm -hmm. I'm fairly certain it's Georgia and like, cause he lives in Georgia. Um, and there's plenty of references in some of the songs to, uh, you know, Georgia steel and Dade County, Mm -hmm. Miami, that kind of stuff. Um, and this is another one of those songs that's about the inexorable March of progress. The mines dried up. The town ain't what it used to be. There's vines growing all over the old football field. Everything's changing. And this is a town that used to run on an industry, used to run mm-hmm. on coal, uh, the steel mill, all these like very Springsteenian working class imagery. Yeah. And 
now that that whole way of life is gone, what are these people supposed to do? And, and like, again, not axiomatically, but in a lot of cases, they've replaced, you know, being employed in the mind to an opioid addiction because of the way that that shit was like completely unregulated for the longest time. Mm -hmm. It was turned into an epidemic. So not only do these people lose their way of life, but now they're having their actual lives threatened by this addiction. It's a tough position to be in. And the song is asking for a lot of your empathy because again, a lot of Republican candidates will stand up and go, I'll bring coal back to Pennsylvania or Kentucky and, We're going to have that good, clean burn and coal energy, and it's going to be jobs. And, you know, I understand you're you're trying to say you're going to take care of these people and make sure that they don't lose their way of life. Then again, these are all giant environmental hazards, which concern all of us. So Mm -hmm. what do you do? What becomes of these people? And if they voted for Trump, to use him as a specific example, then... Yeah, they have to have an honest conversation with themselves. How do I square up what I wanted, which was the guy that was going to bring jobs, versus what he was, which was a racist and an asshole and a dumb Mm -hmm. fuck? So, of course, they still voted for him. But this is a song that's kind of asking you to pity these people because their backs are so put up against the wall that sometimes they kind of do have to make a deal with the devil. And I didn't mean to front end load your pick (laughs) with my thoughts. So I'll yield the floor. (laughs) Well, I honestly, this one in particular, this song kind of gave me the idea and it goes along with what you were saying with like, what's left for these people after these industries leave, you know, and they went, you know, they go through, you know, they, you know, these boom towns go through these really great periods of prosperity, you know, and then all of a sudden, when you know the industries start to move away from using coal you know when homes aren't heated by coal anymore we've moved on to fossil fuels and we moved on to solar energy and wind farms and things like that you know what does happen to these folks and i think it's instead of making them look stupid for the decisions that they've made like look at what they were told you know you get told that somebody's going to take care of you and you take that at face value does that make you a bad person does that make you stupid i think that maybe the worst thing you could say about them is that they were too trusting. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's, that's the biggest criticism that you can give to these folks is that they were sold a false bill of goods basically when it comes down to it. And I think this song in particular, you know, the title let us breathe is, you know, it kind of sends the message of the whole song. Like it's, it's give us a chance. You know, you've taken all these things away from us. Like give us something to work with. We will make our lives, our own way, but we have nothing. You've taken away our ability to prosper. You've taken away our ability to stay healthy because, you know, also what lacks in these places is healthcare. So, you know, what you end up with is just these over over prescribing doctors who solve every problem with just writing what they need on a piece of paper. And that gets people addicted. And that happens all over the country and all over the Mm -hmm. world. But in particular, it was a bad epidemic of that in this part of the world, in this part of the United States. And I think when you don't have anything else, you know, it's a very easy thing to fall into. And this song kind of gave me the vibes that I was like listening to a concert in a ghost town, you know, and I I think Mm -hmm. that's kind of what I got through a lot of the songs, but this one in particular, where it's like, you're, I almost picture him just like sitting on the porch of, you know, a house in the middle of town, just like singing these songs to nobody because there's nothing left. You know, there's nobody, you know, and there's people there, but there's nobody left to hear these songs. There's nobody left to understand it because they've been so beaten down so far. And I think the perspective he puts it in is that, you know, maybe you could say what you want about who they voted for. You can say what you want about any of that. Mm -hmm. But the fact is they were lied to. You know, they were they were told that it was going to be one way if they voted one way and it didn't turn out that way. And or if they believed in something, you know, that it that it would come true. And they've time after time after time, they have been failed as communities, as individual people. So where do you think they're going to end up? They're going to end up in exactly the places that he describes in this album, including in Let Us Breathe. He said something like the coal mine shut down in 79 or something like that, Mm -hmm. or it hasn't produced coal since 79. Um, And that's the story of a lot of places. You know, that's the story of the steel mills in Pennsylvania. For a long time, you know, there's ton. That's the story of the auto plants in Detroit. You know, there's tons of places where it's not necessarily just Appalachia, and it's not just necessarily the coal industry. 
This is a story that is applied to a lot of people all over the world, especially in the United States. And I think these are the types of songs that give a voice to those folks. And these are the ones that are important to listen to. Yeah. And to follow our album theme, this is like a pure cry of desperation. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're that observer, if you're that Calico gym type, how can you see this suffering all around you and not become more invested? So it's just like that further step along the way that is about finding that community. And again, what are you going to do and what do you believe? So again, really well-structured album. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes right into Jimmy the cop and the one line in this one that I think really kind of encapsulates the whole album is it's a Before stubborn you start. Oh shit. I was going to try to guess it. Never mind. Was that it? It was not it. So oh. a bit railroad. Anyway. <laughs> well, well, what are you going to do? We can only, we, we can only it. have the same brain sometimes, you know, yeah. um, when he says it's a stubborn march toward decay, you know, and that's, and I think that is very descriptive of the people that he's got because they're not just giving up. You know, they've they've kind of been given no choice but to just accept things the way they are. But there's always that sense that if they were given a chance, if you if they were given a spark, you know, maybe they could start a fire from that, you know, and it's it's that idea that these are industrious people. You know, these are not people that just want to be given handouts. You know, they want to be given an opportunity to make something of themselves, to make something good and right in their society again. And I think that's what this is about. You know, it's he's he shows he's got classic country chops on this song. You know, this is as classic a country of a story as as you're gonna get. And it's just it's incredible to hear somebody that has this level of talent. You know, and I love Tyler Childers and I love Sturgill Simpson, but they don't do this kind of storytelling. You know, they they talk from the first person a whole lot, and not saying that one is better than another. But this is a very particularly good style of songwriting. This is the kind of songwriting where you're kind of you're going to look back at it and this tells you something. It's not just enjoyable to listen to. It is, but you get a little something more out of it. And a song like Jimmy the Cop does exactly like does exactly that because it tells another story about another situation that they have to deal with in this part of the world. And it's you know, it's just, you don't want to give up, but it's just constantly these people are getting told there's nothing left for them. Mm-hmm. You know, and then what do you do in that situation? Yeah, and and for me, the line that really sold the whole thing was, "I was born already dead." Mm-hmm. Like that—that that is such a fucking absolutely miserable, depressing notion. But we know plenty of people who feel like they're fated to suffer, and if the circumstances in your life are bad enough. And the choices you make lead you down a bad path. You will 100% believe that you were you were fated to suffer. You were fucked from the beginning, mm-hmm. and that's such a like fatalistic out outlook to have. But uh, another little tidbit: I was trying to see like other people's reviews, like what mm-hmm. people thought of this, and I did find one. And someone put it a great way. They were like, "Jimmy the Cop" is the song that takes place after the protagonist from Copperhead Road just goes and completely fucks his entire life up. Yep. And I certainly that's, see that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good way to describe that. And if folks aren't familiar with Copperhead Road, the Steve Earle song, you know, it's about a guy that, whose family has just basically skirted the law for their entire lives. You know, his, his grandfather made moonshine, his dad did the same, and then he grew cocaine, or he grew marijuana, right? One yeah, of the he, two. He grew pot. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, and, it, and it's just like that idea of this person on the outskirts of society because there was nothing else for them. So, like, how was he supposed to make a living otherwise? You know, he figured out how to how to grow the stuff and then he decided he was going to do it. And this and it does lead right into, you know what I think we should do sometime? This kind of a sidetrack is we should try to build a story. With songs just from random artists, like if somebody gives us you know, a plot to a story or some sort of way, you know, how a story begins, then how a story ends. And then we got to come up with songs that kind of get you there. I think that would be kind of a cool thing to try to do. That could be interesting. It's like the Hitler Wikipedia thing. You need like six clicks to get to Hitler or something. Yeah. 
except ho- not horrible. So that'd be good yeah, for us. Yeah, to great, great example. <laughs> do a music one. Yeah. I can't not invoke Trump and Hitler in the same episode. Just like I can't not invoke Frank Zappa every episode. Yeah. Oh, that was that, smooth. That was solely to get to that point. It that was, was smooth. We're gonna get. We're gonna get shadow banned. I think. Woo! With all this, with all this Hitler talk. Shit. Better not yeah. say it one more time. It's like <laughs> Beetlejuice. Yeah. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Uh oh. Don't now, say it one more time. <laughs> the next song, I I think personally, this one is the best song on the album. The one that you picked, Sawtooth Jericho. This was the one that I immediately went back to and started over again. Because for mm. some reason this one just struck me a little different than the rest of them did. And I was like, damn, that is a good song. Well, it's got to be the way it sounds because the lyrics are like absolute borderline gobbledygook. <laughs> I, I like I look at the li- like. So, OK, not spoiling anything, because by the time this episode comes out, my latest episode of singles will have debuted. And I did a song by a Dutch musician named Sophie Strat. Mm-hmm. And there's a part in the song where just like if you run it through Google Translate from Dutch to English, it's totally fucking incomprehensible. It's like Bob Dylan lyrics, just like uh, uh, unreal levels of gobbledygook. And I understand he's talking about real things in this song. Mm -hmm. And again, it sounds awesome. So if I listen to it the same way, like I can't speak Dutch, just like I can't speak hillbilly, then this is a fucking really dope song. But in terms of like what I'm supposed to get out of the English words he is ostensibly saying, couldn't fucking tell you. Yeah, see, I think... I think I understand enough of it, you know, to to kind of pull what he's trying to say is is this is kind of where he's trying to like really turn the album around, you know, where he's trying to like add a little bit more hope into things is kind of the sense I get, um, you know, with the verse two when he says sweating out the milkweed in Rabin County, we were born from the myth, don't you ever doubt it. The fact that he rhymed county with doubt it was pretty was pretty slick, first of all. <laughs> On the slaughter bench of history, gasping for air, Sequoia play lacrosse with a ball made of hair. So he's talking about all these things. To me, he's talking about all these things that have happened in that area, you know, and while his people have forg- have are getting forgotten by history because their industries no longer exist. And it's just a matter of time before the generation of people that even know what that life was like die out and there's nobody to tell those stories anymore. The same with the Sequoia. You know, and I think he's he's just tr- kind of drawing parallels to like, well, you know, their way of life died out. Our way of life is dying out. When he's saying on the slaughter bench of history, gasping for air, you know, they're on their last gasp. You know, the, unless something drastically changes, that way of life is going to be over. You know, and, and I think that's him. This is a little more of that defiance that he's adding into it, you know, the, where he said it's a stubborn mor- march toward decay. You know, he's not giving up quite yet. And I think that's kind of the sense that I got from this song. Um, And I think it's I think it's a really interesting way when he says we are born from the myth. Don't you ever doubt it? And that's this myth of the way these people are supposed to be, you know, and so like they still have this way of life right now. But he's like, we're not the same as the people that actually worked in the mines. You know, the mines were a long time ago. I didn't do that. All I've seen is the ramifications. So. You know, they they weren't born in the life where the mines existed, where the prosperity was there, but they're born in the area where that stuff was. So they're part of you look at them that way. Outsiders would see them as part of that industry and part of that world, but they really weren't. So it's like kind of this halfway place that they're trying to exist in while their way of life is dying out and while they're trying to exist and find a new way of life. You know, people are forgetting about them. They're not getting the help that they need. And and I think it's just his way of saying, like, time marches on and eventually it's going to forget about everybody. But we're going to try to hang on as long as we can. You got all of that from flush him a covey. He can run them fields. I pawn my <laughs> fiddle for a go to his bail. <laughs> I mean, not that part in particular, but when he says, because we like the chase of that holy grail. Yeah, we like the taste of that Bob White quail. You know, he's talking about these very traditional things that they do. And, and you know, we like the chase of that holy grail is that, you know, religion plays a big part in that area. 
you know, so it's like, how do we find our way out of this? Their holy grail is gaining these industries and gaining that prosperity back. But is that, can that really happen? The holy grail has always traditionally been something that's always out of reach. Nobody's ever actually able to get it unless you're, well, Indiana, and, unless you're and, Indiana Jones, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> um, I don't know. This verse was actually the one I understood the most. I think he's talking about just playing with his dog. I honestly think he's yep. talking about like, setter is the dog the holy grail is just like oh good killer got a fucking or Llewellyn I think is the dog's name oh Llewellyn got a quail oh we're gonna eat good tonight boy I just you just see a guy out like hunting with his dog it's very cute it's very nice but like the stuff that preceded it I definitely got imagery Mm -hmm. and maybe that's now that I hear myself say it the whole purpose of the song because again I loved it it sounded great yeah and I had to enjoy it as like it's in old English but now that I think about it, maybe the purpose is just to be imagery and a nice little break in the action where it is purely just impulse and images and sound and vision and, and like a slice of life, a day in the holler. Mm-hmm. It's not trying to get too ahead of itself. This is just the shit we do and the shit we like, in which case it adds further texture to the world. And I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. See, I love that, that we got completely different things. Yeah. From that song. Because I got all sorts of I got all sorts of meaning from that song. Like all sorts of pain, all sorts of suffering, yeah. all sorts of meaning out of that song. And I yeah, I, I like that. You know, I don't know if that's something he meant to do, but Pony, I guess good on you for coming up with something that can be interpreted, you know, so drastically different by two experts, I might say. Yeah, um, correct. Yeah. Um yeah, I really I, I thought this one was very good, you know musically was excellent i think that's what drew me in first and then when i listened to the lyrics and kind of went through it again you know i really feel like i understood you know this song and what he was trying to do with it is that it is that slice of life it is that imagery but you know i think there's always that sense of there's the background of the history of the area and the background of the history of of what happened there and that's kind of where you know i I put that in with it and it just kind of gave that other layer of meaning to it for me yeah, and it's it's again, if you want to talk about getting sutured into the community, it's the kind of thing like this is the crick where nine men held off the invading armies of whoever the fuck. Yeah. Like they they fought off Johnny Law, like a bunch of moonshiners took their stand. Again, that's shit that makes you go like, damn, there's a lot of history here. Your mm-hmm. investment just furthers like I'm really like hammering that a lot because I think that's a great idea for a concept in an album because like you want us to keep listening. You want to suck us in. And this character is also being sucked into this brand new world. It's just, it's it's like poetry, Jeff. He himself <laughs> references Homeric poetry, and by golly, he's done it. He he's done it. He's done it. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about the song Guru. Um, so this one was one of my picks, and specifically because, and I I kind of alluded this to this earlier in the episode, but if people aren't familiar with the artist Brownbird, um, well, it was a band. I guess it was a guy and and his wife. Um, you know, very, very like kind of dark music, very, very, has a lot of kind of religious vibes to it. You know, he'd been kind of burned by religion, you know, and you can kind of get that sense. And I think the same way that Brown Bird treated religion is the same way that Pony Bradshaw treats or Calico Jim, I suppose, treats the history of that area and what's expected of him. And it's just kind of like, some things that you associate with the area are very toxic. You know, the, the fact that there have been, you know, severe drug addiction problems there. There's abject poverty there because there's just no industry left for them. And there's no way that they could support any new stores that come in or anything like that. Cause there, if there's no money coming in, how is there any money going to be coming out of their pockets to go back towards any of this stuff? And I really, you know, I kind of heard Brown bird and kind of, drew those conclusions myself much earlier in the album but this was the song when i got to it i was like yeah that really cements it for me that this is what he's been going for this whole album is just letting you know that there's more to the story than just poverty than just addictions you know there's more to it than that there's a reason why those things happened and you should understand where these people are coming from and don't just write them off, you know, and I think that is something that's really important. You know, I don't know if it's necessarily what he was trying to do with the album. He might've been just trying to tell a story and not necessarily just trying to advocate for this part of the country. 
Um, but I think he ended up doing just that. I think with throughout the whole thing, what he ended up doing was showing the heart, the humanity, you know, the drive, the stubbornness, the toughness of these people that are from that area. And if given the chance, what they could accomplish again. And I think it's something that is, you know, I think is a story that people should listen to. You know, I really, I think throughout this whole album, we only picked the six songs, but the whole album was really excellent. And I think thematically was strong all the way through. Well, and here's the thing about Guru, right? You're new in town. What is one of the most powerful things that can keep you there, especially as a young man? A nice lady. I'm talking about getting that butt on the reg. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, that's part and parcel with the experience. A so new mm-hmm. in town and you meet someone who catches your eye. He keeps saying, she was my guru. This is someone that mm-hmm. opens you up to new experiences. And it, it sounds like it's tinged with a little toxicity and regret, but mostly pleasant feelings about somebody that, once again, gave you that investment in your surroundings. It's a local gal, and she just, like, sh- shows you shit you never knew existed where you come from. Mm-hmm. And, again, that's what's so great is, like, Pony Bradshaw filled out the entire map. Let's address romantic relationships. Let's address commerce and jobs and the local economy. Let's address poverty. Let's address addiction. Let's address tradition and history and culture. And it's just... It's like a really richly rendered album, the whole thing start Mm -hmm. to finish. And to your point, I think it goes down, you appreciate it way better if you listen to the whole thing. I'm not sure any one song necessarily, the closest one to me would be Guru, to get plucked out to listen again because you're Mm -hmm. like, ooh, it's it's in my DNA. Yeah, This one just has those like sultry kind of witchy vibes, and I like that. So I don't know, I, I could see myself listening to this one again on its own but for the most part this is an album i think kind of really needs to be listened to start to finish in a sitting yeah absolutely we've done several like dua lipa was a banger all the way through but you could take any one of those songs out and and listen to them on their own and be just fine you know miley cyrus album same deal you know so we've done both ways like the bruce springsteen album letter to you i mean you could pick any one of those songs out and you just got yourself a banger Bruce Springsteen song. You know, I think with this album, you're doing a disservice to yourself and understanding what he's trying to tell you. If you try to take any one piece out and just try to digest that, I think listening to the whole thing, it's like 45 minutes. You know, I listened to it the first time while I was mowing the lawn and it's just something like, you know, I was glad to be doing something that's pretty mindless. You know, you just got to follow your lines and that's it. So I was able to really listen to the song and listen to the you know listen to the music throughout and it really really struck me that I couldn't wait to sit down and like get out my notebook and really start trying to write write some things down about it and really start to try to unpack it you know because listening to it from start to finish you get a different experience and I think you get the experience he's trying to convey and I I think it's a really really admirable effort of an album you know it's not one like I've heard very many times before you know you don't tend to hear a lot of concept albums in this genre of music you know they tend to be in you know some i guess in rock music is generally kind of where i always hear them and you don't tend to hear them a lot in country in americana and i think it's something that's really impressive that he's done here yeah and again i love that it's a big picture album you got to sit you got to give it its due and you're rewarded and I can't even say for your patience. If you need a 45-minute album to be done quickly, fuck you. You shouldn't be listening to music. <laughs> yeah. Turn in your ears. I'm done with you. <laughs> it's 45 minutes well fucking spent, so just do it. Yeah. I mean, you got a road trip or something. You're driving, you know, that little Barry to Burlington situation sometime. You know, just throw the album on and listen to it and and really try to hear what he's what he's saying because I think there's a lot of important things addressed on this album. And even if you don't want to pay attention to the political stuff on it or the economic stuff on it or really get into any of those kind of nuts and bolts, it is a pleasant listen just on its own. You know, you don't have to necessarily try to unpack it. He's got a great knack for melody. You know, he takes what could be a really, you know, kind of, you know, a lot of folks are have done a lot of things in this genre of music. A lot of folks have done some great, incredible things in this genre of music. So at this point, you got to, bring a little something extra you know you got to put a little extra sauce on it to really stand out to me and i think he did exactly that with this album by 
making it a whole story instead of just like, oh, look how redneck I am. Look at all these things I like to do. And, and like that, it's adding the humanity to all of that. You know, he talks about hunting with his dog. You know, that's something that we've heard in The Bird Hunters by Turnpike Troubadours, you know, which is another excellent song. But it's like taking something that's such a simple idea, right? This like hunting with your dog, but then adding in like why you're there, like why that's a part of you, you know, why that's something that you're proud of doing. And I think when you do that, it takes it from the tailgates and tan lines level of songwriting into something a lot more and a lot more important and something that's actually worth taking the time out of your day to listen to. Well, I'm giving it a stream it. Absolutely. Stream it, folks. Certainly. Uh, Be ready for kind of a sad experience, but a very, very good experience. You know, I think this is a really excellent album and just listening to somebody as talented as this do something like this is rewarding in itself for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for the album. Um, Was there anything else this week that you had a burning desire to talk about? No, I just go watch the latest uh, singles video. This album, uh, the artist is Sophie Strat. I can't say her name without doing that. It's just too fun. <laughs> the artist is Sophie Strat, and the song is Hey Yvonne. So go check that out on our YouTube. And uh, I think that's the only plug I got, Jeff. All right. Yeah. So YouTube's, the singles videos come out every single, see what I did there? Thursday. <laughs> yes yes you like that um so find that on youtube search hashtag out on that line you'll find the videos that way make sure you subscribe you know our, our subscriber count seems to go up every week so we really appreciate the folks that have already subscribed um and we'd appreciate you if you haven't yet if you went ahead and clicked that button gave us another subscriber that way you'll keep up with all of our videos when we release something other than singles videos as well you're going to be notified of that Send us those album submissions in our DMs on Twitter, at out on that line one, in our DMs on Instagram, at out on that line, on Facebook, out on that line podcast. You could even send us an email, out on that line at gmail.com. Uh, you're going to find this podcast. If, uh, if you don't like the service that you're on, go try something else because we're everywhere, baby. We are everywhere. And we've got what? That's going to be 12 singles videos that we've got up there now? Yeah, this is the 12. Yeah, the, the dirty dozen singles videos that we've got up on youtube right now plus the audio versions of all of our podcast episodes so you can catch up to everything we've ever done on youtube you can find all of our podcast episodes loaded on spotify apple podcasts anchor like i said wherever it is you get your podcasts we'll meet you there and if you've got nothing else this week Koch, until next time